Hello, fellow teachers and students of the scriptures. Welcome to Teaching with Power. I'm Ben Wilcox, and I want to thank you for joining me for our study this week of Matthew chapter 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20 through 21. And this, my friends, is our final week on the life of the Savior, final week in the Gospels. So we're hitting quite the milestone this week in our study of the New Testament this year. And I pray that uh, you felt the Spirit as we've studied the life of the Savior. And I hope that you're excited for the remainder of the New Testament. Uh, there are some incredible things that we still get to study uh, between now and the end of 2023. Now remember that my goal with this channel is to help you to either study or to teach the Scriptures with more relevancy and power. And uh, if you're ready, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. And a quick note before we get started here. I shared some thoughts about the resurrection in my Easter video with some insights about the appearance of Christ to Mary Magdalene at the Garden Tomb. So if you'd like my thoughts on that event for this week's lesson, then just click on this link in the upper right-hand corner of your screen and it'll take you to that video, and then just go to timestamp 1913. And I'll also put a link to that video in the description below. But for our first portion of this week's lesson, I'd like to begin with a resurrection of Christ pre-test activity. And this could help lead your students through some of the major events surrounding the Savior and his resurrection. So you're first gonna allow your students some time to answer the questions without using their scriptures. And then as you correct it, direct them to the specified verses that I'm going to provide here and let them see if they got it right or not. And you're going to notice that I don't ask questions that deal with the story of the two disciples that Christ meets on the road to Emmaus or the contents of John chapter 21. But that's by design. We're going to give those two stories entire lessons of their own. But here we go. Number one, true or false, Jesus was buried in a rich man's tomb. And that would be true. You can read about this in Matthew 27, verses 57 through 60. His body was placed in the tomb of a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. And we learn that this tomb was hewn or carved right out of a rock and uh, only a rich man would be able to afford such a tomb. So all of the pictures that we have of the resurrection and this large stone rolled away from the door of the tomb, uh, we can thank Joseph of Arimathea for that and, uh, and his generosity in supplying our Lord with such a setting for the greatest miracle of all history. Number two, Mary Magdalene was the only person to go to the tomb on Easter morning. And that is false. There were a number of other women who went to the tomb that morning. Mary Magdalene was one, but there was also the other Mary, which Mark describes as the mother of James. And then he also includes a woman named Salome. And then Luke tells us that a woman named Joanna is there, and other women as well. So, there was more than one witness to this initial experience with the tomb being open. And then number three, there was an angel standing on the stone that was rolled away when the women came. And the answer to this is also false. Now, if you read the account of this in the Matthew 28, 2 and Mark 16, 5 versions, it tells us that there was a single angel sitting on the stone. And, and I really love that image of the angel just casually resting there, sitting back on top of the stone, almost as if to say, you know, what did you expect? Jesus told you that this was going to happen. Now, Luke and John record it just a little bit differently. And both of them say that there are two angels, but Luke has them standing there. But, but here, that would still make the statement false because the question only mentions one angel. And which of the accounts is the most accurate one? I can't say. I don't know. And I'm not sure it matters that much, but 
I do prefer the sitting angel version of the story. Number four, the angel said, he is not here for he is resurrected. And that would be false. The word is risen, not resurrected. He is not here for he is risen or some variation of that statement. And how wonderful is that announcement? Jesus is risen. He wasn't gone. He wasn't slumbering in death. And because of his rising, so too will we all rise, as well as those whom we have loved and lost. Number five, which apostle was the first one to see the empty tomb? The answer is C, John. You can read about that in John 20, verses three through six. When the women come and inform them of the empty tomb, both Peter and John come running. But John, very humbly, tells us that he got there first. But then, probably out of respect for Peter and his authority, he waits for him and allows Peter to actually go into the tomb first. It's kind of a fun extra extra detail there. Number six, Mary Magdalene was the first person to see the resurrected Christ. That is true. In John 20, 11 through 18, we have that sweet story of Jesus appearing to Mary as she weeps at the empty tomb. And as I said earlier, if you'd like my thoughts on that special event, I encourage you to go back and watch my Easter video. Number seven, Thomas was the only apostle that doubted Christ was really resurrected until he saw him. And that would be false. Both Mark and Luke include the other apostles as not believing. Mark 16, 11 through 14 says three times that they did not believe the accounts of the women and the story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Luke 24, 11 also uses the word they to describe those who did not believe until they saw him. But I also like how Luke says it in verse 41 of that same chapter. He says that they believed not for joy when they finally see him. Perhaps that's the kind of unbelief that we've got going on here. It's not so much an unbelief of doubt or skepticism, but an unbelief of, oh, oh no, that, that's just too good to be true. I can't believe it because that's just too wonderful. So number eight, Thomas wished to touch the wounds in the Savior's side, hands, and feet before he would believe that Jesus was resurrected. Now, that is true. The story about Thomas's doubt is a little more detailed and straightforward. And we find that account in John 20, 25 through 29. And this does teach us an important lesson. The first time Christ appears to the apostles, Thomas is apparently not there. And he declares that he refuses to believe them until he has seen Christ with his own eyes and touched the wounds with his own hands. And when Christ does appear to the apostles eight days later, again, Thomas is there this time and he believes. And then Christ makes this statement. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Well, who would that blessed apply to? Hopefully you and I. I've never seen the resurrected Christ, but I believe that he lives. Most of us are going to have to live by that kind of faith. And I do believe in the accounts of those who were eyewitnesses. However, I hope that we're not too hard on Thomas here. Uh, for one, the other apostles also doubted. And I don't believe that Jesus said that verse with a tone of disappointment or anger or frustration. We all face our own doubts and questions when it comes to our beliefs. And Jesus still gave Thomas this confirmation and this witness, even though he struggled to believe at first. Christ can do the same for us. He can help us through those difficult times of doubt 
and will provide us with personal experiences that can confirm what we hope to be true. What we feel is maybe even too good to be true. Number nine, what was the apostle's initial reaction to seeing the resurrected Savior? Was it joy, fear, sadness, shame, or anger? If we look in Luke 24, 36 through 38, the words used to describe that initial appearance are terrified, affrighted, troubled, and thoughts arose in their hearts. So the answer is B, fear. And I think that we could probably understand this. They had just witnessed with their own eyes Christ being cruelly crucified days before. How could it be him? So it's got to be a ghost, a spirit. But what are the first words out of Jesus's mouth? Peace be unto you. It's okay. You don't have to be afraid. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And that must have been said with such love and reassurance. And again, I believe that we too will have that experience with Christ and those that we love also. We will see them again and it will be almost too good to be true. Number 10, a resurrected body has flesh and blood just like mortals. And that is false. In Luke 24, 39, Jesus says that a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. So a resurrected body does have flesh, and it does have bones, but not blood. Joseph Smith taught this truth when he said the following, Concerning resurrection, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, or the kingdom that God inherits or inhabits. But the flesh without the blood and the Spirit of God flowing in the veins instead of the blood. For blood is the part of the body that causes corruption. Therefore, we must be changed in the twinkle of an eye, or have to lay down these tabernacles and leave the blood vanish away. Blood is the corruptible part of the tabernacles. So, it's kind of interesting. Number 11. What did Jesus say to or do with the apostles before he ascended into heaven? And the answer is E, all of the above. So A, he commanded them to go out and teach all nations the gospel. And he does that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That would be their commission for the rest of their lives as special witnesses of Christ. B, he promised that he would always be with them. In Matthew 28, 20, he tells them, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And Mark 16, 20 says, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. See, he prophesied that they would perform miracles and signs. The Gospel of Mark specifically talks about that and, and the signs that would follow them. You can read about that in Mark 16, 17 through 18. D, he gave them a blessing. And that's recorded in Luke 24, 50 through 51. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And I really like that idea. Before he sent them out into the world, he gave them a final father's blessing, so to speak. So Christ did all of those things to help prepare these special witnesses of his for the path that lay ahead. Number 12. After Christ was resurrected, the apostles no longer worshipped in the Jewish temple. And that would be false. Take a look at Luke 24, verses 52 through 53. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. So there we go. Post-resurrection temple worship. 
for members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? I think that's significant. Jesus did not intend temple worship to end after his resurrection. And then 13. All of the following are recorded witnesses of Jesus Christ's resurrection, except who? You got this large list. And the answer to this one is H, the brother of Jared. The brother of Jared is not a recorded witness of the resurrected Christ. Now, he did meet and see Jesus, but that was before Christ was resurrected. He saw Jesus's spirit body, not his resurrected. So that might have thrown you off a little bit. But what I love about this question is the fact that this list is so long. Look at how many witnesses we have of the resurrected Christ. It's not a small group of a privileged few. That's over 3,000 people that we have on record that have seen with their own eyes the living Christ. It's a very strong case. Our faith in Christ need not only rely on our own feelings and emotions. There's strong evidence from authoritative witnesses that Christ is real and that his resurrection is real. And I personally haven't seen Jesus Christ myself, but I believe in the goodness and the honesty of those who say they have. That list helps to build my testimony of him. And that's how I would like to conclude this portion of this week's lesson with my own personal witness of the resurrected Christ. Not that I've seen him physically, but I feel that I have come to know him well spiritually. I know that my Redeemer lived, that he lived a mortal life and came to this earth to teach us, to prepare the way for us, and to die for us. And I also know that my Redeemer lives. I've actually had the privilege to go to Jerusalem and visit the place called the Garden Tomb and have felt a very special spirit that that, that location carries with it. And there's a lot of historical, scriptural, and archaeological evidence pointing to the fact that this indeed was the place where Jesus was buried and resurrected. Even President Harold B. Lee felt that this was a special place when he visited it. And I'd like to bear witness that I saw with my own eyes that that tomb is empty. And when it was discovered by archaeologists, it was found empty. And the reason why? Because he is not there, but is risen. And he continues to live and love and teach and guide and counsel all those who choose to believe in and follow him. And at this point, I might invite my students if any would be willing to express their witness of Christ, the living Christ and his resurrection. Or you could sing the hymn, I know that my Redeemer lives, or show this uplifting performance of it. Or there are a number of other great videos that you could show to accompany a lesson on the resurrection. My favorite is this one entitled Because of Him. But your students are likely to have seen it before, uh, maybe many times, but, but it is very, very good and, and has a powerful spirit to it. Or you might consider showing the Bible videos from the life of Christ depicting the story of the resurrection. And there are two that cover these events. One that depicts the body of Christ being laid in the tomb and then being opened by the angel. And then, Another where Jesus appears to Mary. Or there's another great video where a number of people bear witness of how the resurrection brings them hope. So lots and lots of resources to choose from this week to teach the resurrection. And I certainly wouldn't show all of those videos, right? But you could maybe pick one or two uh, to help your class visualize and feel the power and the magnitude of this greatest of all miracles. Now, 
There are two specific stories from the resurrection of the Savior that I'd like to dig a little deeper into now. And for our first icebreaker, there's a fun little YouTube video that, <laughs> lots of videos this week, uh, that you could use to introduce the road to Emmaus story that's found in Luke chapter 24. And I can't actually show it here on my channel, but I'm going to include a link to it up at the top here and encourage you to just take a minute and watch it and then come back. And what that video is, if you watched it, it's an observation or an awareness test. And maybe you've seen this kind of thing before, but this was a new one that I hadn't seen yet. In the past, I've used the, the passing the basketball video with, with the bear in it. If you're not familiar with that one, I'll provide a link to that video as well. But it's the same kind of an idea. And the moral of the story of these videos is that it's easy to miss something that you aren't looking for. There may be times in our lives where we may be unaware of something important happening because we aren't looking for it. Well, today in the scriptures, we're going to take a look at a story about two men who were walking the road from Jerusalem to their village called Emmaus after the crucifixion. And they aren't aware of something. What are they not aware of? Look in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 16 for the answer. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. So what were they not aware of? They're not aware that Jesus is walking with them. Jesus has been resurrected at this point, and they don't realize it yet. The scriptures tell us that their eyes were holden, that they should not know them. And there's a double meaning in that description. They don't recognize him physically, but they don't recognize him spiritually yet either. They don't recognize or understand his role as the Messiah and that he had come not to liberate them from the Romans, but from sin and death. So we'll continue with the story by reading Luke chapter 24, 17 through 25, with a search question in mind, which is, how were these two men feeling? Read these verses and look for all the words or phrases that tell us that, either stated or implied. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another, as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came, saying, that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre, and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So how were they feeling? And one word that comes up very directly is the word sad in verse 17. That's the easy one. But as you read the other verses, there are some other emotions that are suggested or implied. For example, verse 21, where Cleopas says, But we trusted, which means we hoped, that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. This implies that they're confused. They're discouraged. They're disillusioned. 
this man who they believed would be their liberator, their leader, the very son of God, is now gone. He's been killed, and things did not turn out the way that they expected them to. And we see the word astonished in verse 22, again suggesting their confusion as to the meaning of all these things that they've experienced and heard. And then Jesus is going to add an emotion for us in verse 25. Slow of heart to believe. They are doubtful, and they don't understand what the prophets have taught about Christ's mission and the meaning of his body being gone from the tomb. Now let's stop for a moment and liken the scriptures to ourselves. Can you relate to these two men? Have you ever felt these emotions before when it comes to your faith? Sad, confused, discouraged about things in your life that have not turned out the way that you hoped or expected? I imagine that most of us can relate to that in some way. Maybe we're also sad about losing a loved one, or we're doubting the reality of the resurrection. Maybe our careers, our, our health, aren't turning out the way that we thought they would. Perhaps we're confused about doctrines of the gospel or the church, and we have doubts and questions about those things. We hope for certain things, just like these two disciples, but the current evidence suggests otherwise. When we feel this way, the story can teach us some important things that we can know or do when we're experiencing these things. And one truth that can help us during these troubling times is to realize something that these two men did not that somebody might be with us, and we just don't realize it. Jesus walks with us, even though we may not always recognize his presence. Cross-reference to Matthew 28, 20. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Jesus promises those who believe in him that he will be with them. That doesn't mean physically or in the flesh but he promises us some measure of his presence, his love, his spirit to always be with us. And have you ever felt that before? Christ walking with you, that you weren't alone. And I feel that I have. Now, a bit of a spoiler alert, if you're not familiar with this story. By the end of the chapter, these two disciples are going to recognize that it's Jesus. But the great message of this story comes from looking for the things that helped them to come to that realization. And that's going to teach us what we can do to also better recognize his presence in our lives. What helped these disciples to recognize that Christ was with them? Verses 26 to 35. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village, whither they went. And he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it, and brake and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us, while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. How can we come to know Christ is with us then? 1. The Scriptures in verse 27, Jesus starts teaching them things about himself from the Old Testament. And in verse 32, they describe how they felt as he opened the scriptures to them. 
did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? And as somebody who loves the scriptures deeply, this is my favorite thought from the entire story. We will recognize the Savior's presence as we open the scriptures and study them and look for Christ in them. I like to draw a line between those two opens. It's kind of a cool connection. When I open the scriptures, the eyes of my spirit are opened as well to the presence and reality of Jesus Christ. And as we open our scriptures, our hearts will burn within us or we'll feel something that will let us know that he's there. Has your heart ever burned within you as you've studied the scriptures? I I pray, I hope that you've had that experience. And I'd like to personally bear witness that I know that the scriptures have that power. That's why I call this channel Teaching with Power. The power in Teaching with Power doesn't come from the insights or the ideas or from me. The power comes from the scriptures themselves and in the spirit that testifies of their truth as we study them. Jesus Christ is on every single page of the scriptures. On some pages, he might be a little bit harder to find, but he's there. And the more you study them, the more we'll come to know him and the more we'll recognize his company as we walk our road back to our eternal home. Number two, in verse 30, it says that he took bread and blessed it and break and gave it to them. And in verse 35, that idea is echoed with the line, he was known of them in breaking of bread. We too can come to know the Savior and recognize his presence as we partake of the sacrament. The sacrament can bring us closer to Jesus. One of the things that helps me to feel the presence of the Savior during the sacrament is to just look at the sacrament table. There's symbolism in the white sheet being draped over the emblems of his sacrifice. It's intended to look like Jesus' body is underneath the sheet. And that can help us to visualize and to connect with his sacrifice at that moment. And then this third idea isn't quite as obvious, and maybe I'm stretching it a little bit, but I do really like verses 28 through 29. When they get to their home, the scriptures say that Jesus made as though he would have gone further. And I might ask my students, why do you think Jesus would do that? Act as if he's just going to keep going. And I'm not sure what they're going to say, but that's a good question. And I think it's because he wants to give them a chance to invite him in. Like a good guest, he's not going to force his way into their home. And they do constrain him. And they say, abide with us. And how does he respond? He does. He he tarries. He abides with them. Graciously accepts their invitation. I believe that that's the same with us. Jesus is not going to force his way into our lives. We've got to invite him in. One way we can do that is through prayer. Another, by attending church. Another, going to the temple. And what is he going to do in response? He'll tarry with us if we give him a chance, if we give him that invitation. Reminds me of one of my favorite hymns of all time. Abide with me. Might even consider singing that. And a great cross reference here from Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So what's going to help us to recognize the, the presence of the Savior in our lives? Studying the scriptures partaking of the sacrament thoughtfully and worthily and praying for him to abide with me. 
to really sink these principles deep into their hearts? Here I would ask if, if anybody would be willing to share a time when one of those things helped them to feel and know that Jesus was with them. When have you felt the Savior walking beside you? And I do believe that that principle here is true. Christ can walk with us even if we don't always recognize it. If we'll study the scriptures, partake of the sacrament, and invite Christ into our lives, then I testify that there will be times when our eyes will be opened and our hearts will will burn within us, just like for those two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And we'll become aware of him because we're looking. Now, John chapter 21, the final chapter of the Gospels. This is going to be our final lesson from the life of Jesus Christ. So for an icebreaker, a very simple activity. I find it very effective to have at the front of my class written on the board during the entire lesson in big letters, a two word question. And you could introduce it wheel of fortune style. You could offer a reward to the first person that discovers what that question is. And to do this, uh, I'll provide you with a link to a website that allows you to create a, a wheel of fortune of sorts, where you can enter the names of each of your students onto a wheel, and then you, you can spin it. And whoever it lands on gets a chance to choose a letter and make a guess. If they get a letter right, then you enter it into the space and allow that person to guess what the question is. And then, and then you spin again and allow somebody else to choose a letter until the question is guessed. But the catch is, the wheel does have to land on your name in order to make the guess. So there may be somebody in your class that knows the answer, but unless the wheel chooses them, they, they can't say it. And so, and so what is our secret question here? Now what? That's the question that I want at the front of my classroom in big letters the entire time. Now what? And as we study John chapter 21, I want you to be thinking about that question. It's the question that the disciples are asking themselves now that the Savior has come, he's taught them, he's died, and been resurrected. It's been quite a journey for them. But now they've got a, a question to answer. Now what? So let's see how they initially answer that question. According to John chapter 21, verse 3, what did Peter and a number of the other apostles decide to do after Jesus' resurrection? The answer is, they go fishing. Right? Uh, they're men, after all, right? But I'd like to follow up that question with, why do you think they decide to go fishing. And the way that I understand it is that they're kind of deciding to just return back to their old lives. I mean, it's what they know, fishing. Jesus was gone now. So in their mind, life goes back to the way it used to be. And a quick note here. In my opinion, nobody has taught the messages of this chapter more masterfully and eloquently than Jeffrey R. Holland. In his conference address back in October of 2012, entitled, The First Great Commandment. In my mind, that should be required reading before you teach this chapter. And I love Elder Holland's thoughts and assessment of Peter's reasoning for going back to fishing at Galilee. He imagines Peter's thoughts going something like this. Brethren, it has been a glorious three years. None of us could have imagined such a few short months ago the miracles we have seen and the divinity we've enjoyed. We have talked with, prayed with, and labored with the very Son of God himself. We have walked with him and wept with him, and on the night of that horrible ending, no one wept more bitterly than I. But that is over. 
he has finished his work, and he has risen from the tomb. He has worked out his salvation and ours. So you ask, what do we do now? I don't know more to tell you than to return to your former life rejoicing. I intend to go a fishing. So, so let's see what happens next. Read verses 4 through 15. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his father's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. <laughs> oh, Peter, you got to love him. Whenever he sees Jesus, you just can't keep him out of the water. <laughs> if Jesus comes walking along, Peter's guaranteed to jump out of the boat. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of great fishes, an hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread, and giveth them, and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples, after that he was risen from the dead. Now, now why do you think Jesus repeats this miracle for them? What might be the message by doing the same miracle he did back when he initially called the apostles to come follow him at the beginning of his ministry? In my opinion, it's a reminder of the conversation that they had after that first time. In that instance, Jesus called Peter to leave behind his nets and become a fisher of men, perhaps subtly hinting at something for Peter, like Elder Holland suggests. Then Peter, why are you here? Why are we back on this same shore by these same nets having this same conversation. Wasn't it obvious then, and isn't it obvious now, that if I want fish, I can get fish? Jesus needed Peter to remain a fisher of men, not just a fisherman. And also, perhaps the great number of fish they pulled in was a symbolic suggestion of the real catch that awaited them. Just like the Lord said, to the agrarian society of the early church in Doctrine and Covenants 4. The field is white and all ready to harvest. Could this be suggesting to the fisherman Peter, the sea is full and ready to be fished. It's time to go a-fishing for a different kind of catch. And then, and then we have this poignant conversation between Peter and Jesus in verses 15 through 17. He takes Peter aside and has a little interview with him. And in this exchange, I hear a loving but firm tone in the Savior's questions and an increasingly fervent yet distressed tone in Peter's. And, and a question to think about as we read these verses. Why do you think Jesus asks Peter the same question three times? So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And, and, and I, I suspect that the these is referring to the fish. He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, Thou knowest that I love thee. 
he saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved, because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. So why does he do that? And there's a lot of possible answers to that question. Could it have been to make a deep impression on him? and us as the readers. When things are repeated, they sink deeper into our minds and hearts. Kind of like Moroni, repeating his visits and message to Joseph Smith multiple times regarding the Book of Mormon. Or was it Jesus' way of getting his attention to prompt him to really search his heart for the answer? If somebody asked you the same question three times, your first answer might be just a quick knee-jerk well, of course, kind of answer. But when they asked you a second and a third time, you would probably really stop and think about the answer. Because Jesus already knew the answer, but, but he wanted Peter to know the answer to that question. And then I like the suggestion that perhaps Jesus is giving Peter an opportunity to express his devotion to Christ three times, as opposed to the night where he denied that he knew Christ three times. This, again, of course, wouldn't be for Jesus' sake, but for Peter's, giving him that chance to really express his love to Jesus Christ, which is an incredible privilege that we all have the opportunity to do. And I pray that we do take that opportunity to express our love for the Savior. And then, and then finally, Peter is correct when he says, Thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. The Lord did know that already. Wasn't the point of his questioning. But he really wants Peter to know something. He wants him to know how to show that love. And that's to feed his sheep. He says it three times. This is the way that you're going to show that you love me, Peter. Take care of my lambs, my sheep, while I'm gone, while I return back to my Father. Shepherd them, serve them, teach them, lead them. And so here, you might highlight the following truth for your class. If I truly love Jesus Christ, then I will feed his sheep. Because this story is all fine and good for Peter's sake. But remember, we want to find personal meaning in the scriptures. And in this case, I think it's very easy for us to relate to him. I don't believe that it's a coincidence that this, John chapter 21, is the final chapter of the four Gospels. It's a fitting conclusion. Just like Peter, we too have been on a journey with the Savior. These past six months, as we've studied his life, we've sailed with him on the Sea of Galilee. We've sat at his feet as he taught the Sermon on the Mount. We've seen him heal the sick, cause the lame to walk, and even raise the dead. We've watched him show love and concern for all types of people, from little children to adulterers, and from lepers to Roman centurions. And most importantly, We've watched from a distance his blood drip from every pore in the Garden of Gethsemane, the nails driven into his hands and feet on Golgotha, and the glorious triumph of his resurrection at the Garden Tomb. Now, more than ever, we need to put ourselves into Peter's sandals and ask ourselves, are we going to return to our former lives as if nothing has happened? Are we going to conclude our study of the New Testament with a, well, that was nice, and then go a fishing? Or continue just being the same people that we've always been? The questions Jesus asks Peter 
are meant for us to consider. And so I invite you to have that sacred conversation with Jesus Christ yourself. Imagine yourself sitting across from him uh, next to the gentle lapping waters of the Sea of Galilee. Look into his eyes as he says, Do you love me? Three times. And, and only you can answer that question. But I, I pray and I, and I hope and I anticipate that we could all answer in the affirmative. And, and, then, and then look into the Savior's loving eyes and hear his gentle instruction. Feed my sheep. That's the answer to our big question up on the board. Now what? The Gospels are meant to change us, to make us better sons and daughters of God. So let's go out. Let's go feed his sheep. What does that look like? What does it mean to feed Christ's sheep? How does somebody in the year 2023 go out and fulfill that charge? Again, I might turn to Elder Holland's words for help. So we have neighbors to bless, children to protect, the poor to lift up, and the truth to defend. We have wrongs to make right, truths to share, and good to do. In short, we have a life of devoted discipleship to give in demonstrating our love of the Lord. We can't quit, and we can't go back. After an encounter with the living Son of the living God, nothing is ever again to be as it was before. The crucifixion, atonement, and resurrection of Jesus Christ mark the beginning of a Christian life, not the end of it. So that's what we must do. We must go out and feed our brothers and sisters and live different, speak different, think different, be different. To sink this truth deeper into our hearts, a few questions to ponder. Has your study of the life of Jesus Christ changed you in any way? How? What are some nets and fishes you may need to leave behind in order to follow the Savior? And how can you better feed his sheep? And that, I believe, is critical for us to consider at the close of our study of the Gospels and the life of Christ. But, but that's not all. <laughs> We're not quite done yet. The chapter doesn't end there. There are a few additional thoughts for us to consider to our now what question before we close. Because Jesus is going to continue his conversation with Peter. He's going to reveal something about Peter's future to him. Something rather devastating and, and difficult to hear. And I'm sure that Peter remembers that the last time Jesus made a prophecy about his future regarding his three denials, that it came true. So this time, Peter has no doubt that this is going to come true. And can you, can you figure out what Christ means by these verses? Can you interpret them? John 21, uh, 18 and 19. Well, what's he saying is going to happen to Peter? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, meaning you dressed yourself, and walkest whither thou wouldest, and you went wherever you wanted. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. Now, now if you can't figure that out, read the next verse for some help. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. Ah, so, so he's telling Peter something about the way he's going to die. He's revealing to him that this journey of discipleship will eventually lead him to a place where he, Peter, would stretch forth his hands and somebody else would gird or hang him there and carry him to a place that he doesn't want to go. 
How is Peter going to die? He's going to be crucified. Can, can you just imagine what facing that realization would have been like for Peter? I mean, he's just witnessed the horror and the pain of what crucifixion is like. And here Jesus is saying, Peter, if you choose to show your love for me by feeding my sheep, they will eventually do to you what they did to me. And, and Peter will be crucified. Upside down, no less. But it's the next words out of Christ's mouth that really carry the impact. What does Jesus ask of Peter after revealing this? And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Now that is some follow me. He's asking Peter to not only follow him in life, but to follow him in the manner of his death as well. Therefore, for you and I, who are probably never going to be asked to die for the gospel, to be crucified for the gospel, hopefully we would be willing to sacrifice and give and do whatever our Lord asks of us in order to follow him. If Peter could say yes to that, follow me. Hopefully we can say yes to any come follow me that Jesus requires of us. So what's our next now what? Follow Christ to the end. And then, and then after that, Peter does something so human. He turns around and he sees John in the distance. And he asks Jesus a question. Verses 20 through 21. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? <laughs> and I just, I just love that. I can totally see myself doing something similar. Jesus has just revealed to him the way he's going to die. And the first words out of Peter's mouth are, wait, wait, wait what about him, though? What's going to happen to John? Does his future hold some calamity like mine? Then Jesus' answer in verse 22, Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Now, what do you make of that? What lesson do you feel Jesus is trying to teach Peter here? And, and by the way, these are the last recorded words of Christ in the Gospels. You may remember that in the Gospel of John, the first recorded words of Christ was also a question. What seek ye? John's Gospel is also going to end with a question, accompanied by what I would refer to as the last follow me. So what, what's the lesson? I think he's teaching us not to concern ourselves with the paths of discipleship that others walk. To beware of the dangers of comparison. Everyone's path and experience in life is going to be different. But our major concern must be to continue to follow Christ, no matter what. And the paths of these two disciples couldn't have been more different. Peter is going to be crucified and die an extremely painful death. And John is never even going to taste of death. He gets to tarry until I come. If ever there was a moment to shout out, that's not fair, this would be it. And yet Jesus' response is, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. And the answer is the same for us, whenever we feel tempted to compare our lives either negatively or positively with the lives of others, both habits are spiritually dangerous. We may be tempted to ask things like, why do I have to go through this trial and, and sister so-and-so doesn't? Why does everything seem to go right for brother so-and-so and not for me? Or, or we may even struggle with the opposite type of comparison. Why does my life seem so blessed and this other poor individual struggles so much? We feel a little guilty that, that we seem to have it easy. 
one way or another, comparison is hazardous to our spiritual health. Why don't I get those blessings and gifts? Why don't I have their calling? Why do I have to endure this ordeal? What about them? What about them? We are sometimes far too concerned with the destiny, trials, rewards, and blessings of others. And to all such questions, the Lord's answer is the same. If I will that they have this calling and you have another, if I will that you suffer with this sickness, but they have perfect health, if I will that they're blessed with this talent while you are not, if I will that you face this challenge while they don't, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Talk about famous last words. We have enough to worry about in trying to get down our own path of discipleship without adding the burden of figuring out the whys of everybody else's. Therefore, in conclusion, our major concern is to follow Christ. That is the only thing in life that I need to worry about. Not how well my neighbor follows or doesn't follow, or my bishop, or Joseph Smith, or other religions, or the general authorities. It's how I fall. I mustn't let the strengths or weaknesses of others determine what kind of disciple I'm going to be. That's between them and God. I have control over one life and one life only. My own. And that's where my focus must lie. So here in John 21, I think we've come to some pretty good answers to the question, now what? Now that I've met Christ, now that I understand his teachings, his example, his sacrifice, his path, what do I do? I feed his sheep. I endure to the end. I beware of comparison. And above all, I follow him. And then as a teacher, I pass out the following sheet of paper and invite my students to reflect on what they plan to do differently now that they've completed their study of the life of Christ. Now what are they going to do about it? What's their resolution? What's their plan? How will they be different? And then invite them to tuck this paper into their scriptures or into a place where they're sure to see it again. With that, I'd just like to say that it has been such a joy and a privilege studying the life of Christ with you this year. It, re it really is one of my favorite parts of the scriptures to teach. Every time I study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, my testimony grows. My love for Jesus Christ deepens. And I hope that that's been the experience for you these last six months. Thank you, sincerely, for spending this time with me each week. I feel, I feel so fortunate, so blessed that I get a chance to share my love of the scriptures with so many people around the world every week. And I, I just think that every single one of you out there are amazing. That you care enough about the gospel to be willing to search out this kind of content and spend this kind of time listening to it. That speaks volumes about you and your discipleship and your commitment to Christ. Thank you, thank you, thank you for walking that path with me and learning with me. And we're, we're not done, of course. We've got the rest of the New Testament to study. So much to look forward to. Next week, we're going to begin our study of the book of Acts, which continues the story of Christ's church. And now we get to see the apostles really step up into their roles as leaders of the church. We're going to get to meet one of my greatest all-time scripture heroes, Paul. And we're going to study his story and his epistles, which are, granted, a little bit tougher. But if you put in the time and the effort to understand them, they're going to reward you greatly. And then one of my favorite books of scriptures lies ahead, the fascinating book of Revelation at the end of the New Testament. We're going to take a deep dive into that. There, there are great things to come, my friends. So I pray that you'll, you'll stick with me and we can continue 
this journey together. And that, that was where I originally planned to conclude this week. But if you're still with me, a bonus insight right, that I decided to add here at the end. I really do love John's conclusion to the Gospels in verses 24 and 25. Let's just take a brief look at that. This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. And you know, I wish the Christian world had focused on the final verses of the Gospel of John rather than the final verses of the book of Revelation, also written by John, in regards to other writings about Jesus Christ. Do you know which verses from Revelation that I'm talking about? The ones that say, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Now, we know that those verses do not mean a moratorium on Scripture and prophetic revelation, but were simply a warning about changing the words of the book of Revelation itself, a charge not to mess with John's writings. But if only the world had focused on the final verses of the Gospel of John and his lament that there were not enough things written about Jesus— perhaps they would have been more open to other testaments of Jesus Christ, like the Book of Mormon. And that will conclude our lesson for this week. Thank you for spending this time with me and at every week. And I invite you to join me again next week as we dive into the Book of Acts. Teachers, if you would like access to the resources that I create for teachers, go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find links to those resources. And with that, my friends, get out there and teach with power.